How are you? Good, good. And you? Yeah, also good. Yeah, we're still in lockdown, but otherwise good. Okay. Are you in the office or are you? In the studio, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're we're still partly in the uh, in lockdown as well, but uh, slowly getting relaxed a little bit. I mean, the city has opened the last two days, you know, people mm -hmm. think, and Mumbai being how it is, you know, people are already back on the street. Uh, traffic is back up, or maybe about half the amount, but that's still a lot. So it's kind of interesting to see how quickly people have just sort of bounced back, like things are, uh, and at the same time, like cases are increasing, you know, uh, people have moved back, like we've had an exodus of about 4 million people move back into the country, I mean, into the rural parts and the towns. And about 2 million have gone on foot, a little more than 2 million have, like, there are people who have walked from here to Nepal. So it's kind of, you know, just something else in, in terms of what, what's happening. Do you think they will come back? I think it's going to be... For some time, I don't think so. I mean, the people are going to be reticent to come back. Uh, but at some point, they will also have to come back because the workspace is primarily in the cities, you know. Uh, and the, normally, what the way it works, actually, the, the construct of how it works out here, there's always one main member or a couple of main members from a rural part that then will go to the city for work. So that's really the way it's organized. So they will come back, yeah, but I think it'll be six months before people start coming back in the way that it was organized before. Mm -hmm. So it's been sort of interesting to look at, you know, how this whole situation has actually changed the entire dynamics of work, workspace, you know, even just in terms of inhabitation, the city. Uh, we are a city of like 24 million, you know, quite dense. Yeah, and, and does that does it relieve the city a little bit, or is it not like that? Uh, it has in the, for the last three months, uh, but having ventured out for these last two days, just with the uh, with the uh, with the automobiles and you know vehicles back on the street, uh, it it's it's quite interesting or, uh, to observe how quickly that changes back to what it used to be even if it's not in the same density, because we're 24 million, so even if you get half the people out, that's still 10 people out on the street, yeah. which is still a lot. You know, so just, of course, that's not the case right now, but. I think know. there is an interesting uh, irony that in uh, India, maybe the poor people go back to the countryside and in America, the rich people. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, so if I heard you correctly, you said that there's an irony where people go back, you know, the, the, the poorer people go back, as opposed to what's happening in America where the, where the, the rich people are the rich ones who yeah. leave the city. You know. Correct. Uh, I think there's and, a... And, and, and I have a further question. Do you think, you don't think that in those six months, uh, many of the people who uh, went back to the countryside will find reasons and maybe ways of working uh, that uh, en enable them to stay? I mean, uh, if they can? Yes, optimistically, I'm hoping that that's what actually occurs. And I think part of that will happen because, you know, just the security of being home, you know, being on their land, you know, again, just, just I'm talking about, you know, in terms of the perception of land and space and, you know, uh, especially in India, just the just the sheer size of a population that becomes very important. Their home is absolutely critical. That's their sort of, in a sense, their sort of locus or their center. Uh, so they will, I'm quite certain, they will be able, they will be inventing ways of how to stay back and create work for themselves. Yeah. I think what, what it's going, what's happening also is now just because of, you know, just the communication that we have now, that they would be able to work. I just had, you know, a couple of people who I have working, they've just returned back. And he works in West Bengal, which is kind of on the border of Bangladesh. And, you know, I've been sort of working with the whole intention that all this, you know, the research that I do in the studio is with the intention that they actually don't need to work here. They can actually work back from their location because all the resources are there in their location. It's just how to then proliferate it out from their locations that becomes critical. And I think that's something that I, 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 I'm optimistic that's what's going to happen. 
<laughs> but of course, cities also have work and there's a great demand for many things uh, uh, within that. So there will be, I think there'll be a back and forth. So within the studio, what the way I've set it up now, just, you know, with everything that's going, going on, they come work for four months, they return back for a month, they come back for four months, they return back for two months. And that's how it's kind of linked in with the cycles of their holidays or, you know, very critical periods that they require to go back home. But returning back to your, your question, uh, it's interesting because when I talk to them, you know, the people that I'm working with and who've returned back, it's interesting because I ask them what they said, their families are safe, they're in these rural parts, there's no, they don't have any problems there. And they were saying that, you know, food, clothing and shelter is for them, it is in abundance. That is, there's no, uh, they, they farm, you know, there's enough food, there's, you know, the houses are made by them or, you know, by the community. Uh, and the only reason they come to work is because that's the exchange they require. Like if someone falls ill to go to a hospital, to have transport, public transport. And that's the reason why they require to make money. Uh, and the sole reason to come to cities is so that they're, they're able to afford what, uh, what otherwise they don't require in any way to support themselves. You know, I don't. So it's kind of interesting. It's very different. And I think also the psyche of what you mentioned about what's happening in America is uh, it's I think that's the, what I would say is the difference is the sheer uh, density of the numbers we're talking. I mean, we're talking about here millions of people, not, you know, one, not, uh, you know, a thousand. So I think there's the difference also lies in that just the sheer density and incentives in uh, intensity of this sort of movement that has occurred. And, and kind of when you, when you did the M Pavilion, you also kind of uh, wanted to kind of give some of these insights uh, of your research in in India to Melbourne and try to provoke a discussion on that. And of how did you see that at the time? Yes, yes. I think for me, what was what provoked the whole idea of you know making the pavilion on the site was actually with the intent of in some way reclaiming some of this uh, sort of tacit know-how. I think there's, there's a word that describes it called law. And, you know, and something that I discovered, I think what for me was more an important point of the conversation was it's only when you ask the questions or when you begin to connect, they sort of start revealing what they know or what they're sort of holding with them or what is contained in, within them. And the M Pavilion that I sent was actually, it's an Aboriginal structure. That's a similar Aboriginal structure that's made. The forest dwellers who have been completely displaced from the forest. And I had to move my studio of 18 years, like in two weeks, like with all the stuff. And I actually was on a, you know, on a, on a plot of land which abutted these forest dwellers. And so I had to make a space like within two weeks. And you know, I immediately went to them and said, you know, can we put this together? And it was quite interesting. Within two weeks, they were able to make a sort of a space or a shelter for me. And that's actually what provoked, it was around the same time as the M Pavilion too, or maybe a little bit before that. But for me, what became, what was interesting was, you know, how does one provoke to draw out, you know, cultures that have in some way, and I, I want to use the word, uh, not it's sort of like a sediment that has settled so the the the, the latent material still remains it's only when it's when through a question that sort of can emerge so it was also with the idea to in some way engage with what was once predominantly the original culture of that place so that was for me the sort of the preoccupation of you know uh, and that the whole idea of making that ball was to sort of connect and, and ground uh, I think for me, like fundamentally, all my work actually all originates with water. And this is something that I thought, you know, as, as an, you know, as an interest in, in the idea of cities and urbanism and something that I've reflected on for some time uh, was that actually culturally or, or sort of, uh, or in a sort of urban way, cities, let's say, you know, formally constructed or formally, you know, planned out. Uh, so what would be a piazza to Rome is a water tank to a city here in India. 
And of course, these cities now have been engulfed. They were the sort of the wellspring or where the, the cities sort of sprang from. They continue to be used, continue to work. But that's something that, you know, uh, was something that I was interested, you know, in asking was that how do you, you know, what locates uh, for you? What is the pro What is that one thing that would maybe begin to ground a project in terms of a sort of a, a provocation? And in your case, you know, I did read about, you know, the idea of the Agora as a sort of gathering space and, uh, and then this idea of also place of communication. Uh, so is it a conceptual idea or is it a physical idea that, that... I, I think for the M Pavilion, it was definitely kind of based on, on the, the, the large amount of travel to Australia for other projects and to see that everybody is a kind of engaging with society in their own way, but that there is almost no dialogue about it, that it all is taken as for granted and, and nobody discusses the city because it's the best city in the world anyway, in perception of everybody, while you could kind of discuss if that actually is the case and I think the M Pavilion is trying to do that so what what we try to do is just to spark dialogue and and, and by making a contrast yeah, to embed the Agora in nature which is so abundant and so important for Australia and with the highly technical roof above it where which which symbolized more or less the density of the city I think that that contradiction we try to bring in to to have the dialogue so it was definitely part of the conceptual idea to but driving the dialogue was the driving out the dialogue uh, out of people and, and bring them into connection was the idea uh, therefore we also didn't have any boundaries i was going to be surprised to what extent uh uh, simply uh, creating the installation uh, uh, provoked the event uh, almost uh, spontaneously. I know there was a lot of organization, but nevertheless, uh, it, it felt as if it was not only appropriated, but uh, used very intensely uh, exactly for that purpose without uh, too much uh, artificiality or guidance. Right. Yeah, no explanation was actually needed kind of uh, on, on the first day after of the opening of course we just simply inaugurated it and the next day when i came to site very early there was already in every corner things happening yeah. which, was, which was quite interesting to see that people wanted to have the dialogue but they were not enabled to uh, to me it was very interesting to see this with a very simple but I think that's also something that Naomi, I mean, when you mentioned that, it's also very, you know, critical that the client has been able to locate a space within the city, you know, that by having a physicality of something in there, it, I think these provocations uh, are immediately sort of instigated. I mean, the, the same thing with the pavilion was more that just a sort of shelter in which these provocations could occur, whether they were, you know, cultural discussions or discussions, but to kind of upend and kind of take it to a completely different uh, viewpoint. You know, the idea of the bamboo and the way it's tied was it sort of, in a sense, uh, I want to call that technology too, but in a, in a different way uh, of how spaces were organized at some point in Australia as a sort of point of origin of just opening up that kind of communication. To it. Mm. Um, I, I, I would like to ask the mediator. I think that we are supposed to uh, talk also about the effects of uh, Corona, and um, I, uh, I am personally skeptical of all all of us saying that things will never be the same and things will be extremely different and blah blah blah. I think there yeah. will be enormous pressure on uh, things returning back to normal, and I think that. Uh, if we want to use this uh, to uh, implement change or to give, to try to emphasize a different direction, uh, we will make a kind of very, very serious uh, effort. Um, I also want to introduce a kind of interesting um, anecdote. Um, in May, early May, uh, we had our national commemoration of uh, the extermination of the Jews uh, or of the uh, victims of the Second World War 
and it was celebrated uh, in the central square in Amsterdam. And because of the Corona lockdown, uh, there were no people, and uh, there was only the king and the mayor of Ghana, Amsterdam. And uh, the king gave a kind of really good speech, and at the same time, uh, everyone thought that the emptiness was an incredible uh, reinforcement of the message. Um, uh, over a week ago, we had uh, an uh, event that was a protest event uh, against the uh, killing of uh, black people, uh, anti-racialism, and suddenly the same square was completely inundated with uh, people, and there was even a scandal that they kind of didn't maintain the, um, the one meter fifty distance. So in a very short time, we had two completely opposite uh, uh, e events, uh, and, and in a way, both were very much charged to uh, Corona. Uh, but the second one seemed to kind of really indicate that uh, uh, the whole idea of things changing drastically through Corona is simply uh, partly visual thinking, uh, and uh, that uh, unless there is a kind of very strong guidance from somewhere or, or collective guidance, uh, the, a new situation will will not really last, uh, and that it will be very difficult to use this for new uh, ambitions or new ideals, or to kind of resurrect old ideals. What do you think? No, I I would second that, and it's interesting that you bring up two anecdotes, uh, you know, quite close together, back to back with each other, and similarly when we started talking was. The same thing that was applicable here. But here there was a lockdown, and next thing you know, there's a gathering of people in an exodus moving in thousands. And it's it's in some ways similar, and at the same time, you know, the context of how that, that was organized. And what I wanted to say was that Corona is just one thing right now along the way. There will be many other things like the Corona. I mean, you know, just this idea of climate change that we have positioned, you know, that that sort of uh, lurking behind us. So there will be other things that I think will unfold. And, you know, this idea that uh, <coughs> uh, spaces to be organized, or cities need to be reshaped, or uh, specific to a situation like the corona, for me, I don't, you know, I, 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 I agree that where there is a possibility for it, and I think what's interesting is to take note of, you know, the, the observation made about the emptiness and the density. And I think that's something which is exactly what's going to happen in Mumbai in two weeks. <laughs> as the city is going to be filled in again. I mean, mm. every day that I go out, there are more cars, more people on the street. You know, mm. Just the confidence that comes back to be able to sort of venture out. So, uh, yeah, but I, I, I in the same, I think what it has done is to at least provoke the idea of how to find a bridge to provide a space for these kind of very rapid sort of changes that are taking place. And we're going to see more of, I don't think, I mean, a sort of accelerated rate, uh, place, these kind of shifts, or move, you know, shifts that are taking place. And, you know, I think for me, just the curiosity is how does, this, how do, uh, spaces or cities or organization structures provide a provide a way to accommodate these sort of accelerated shifts that are taking place. I think that's for me uh, the more important uh, aspect. Not that there's a solution to a corona, but you know that it's or a solution uh, necessarily to you know what's being what's happening with uh, in America and actually around the world. And it's interesting that. Our country, India, for example, there's been no pro there's been no participation in that uh, commentary because we have that situation in present time, you know, between ourselves. Yeah. You know, we were very confronted with that for centuries, which was being experienced in America right now. And it's interesting that we don't have those protests here while the rest of the world, you know, in Europe, in fact, even in in Hong Kong, in, in South Korea. Uh, but we have that, and that's something that has made me curious, you know, how uh, yeah. 
Don't you also think that the contrast that you highlight, Rem, kind of will become more part of the society where everything in 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 the situation before Corona was simply accepted and everybody took things along? That through such a major impact, which is a major impact as a, as a as a one impact, uh, uh, like a big uh, uh, flood would be on a on one place, and this is a big impact on the world. That people will kind of use that kind of momentum to create more contrast and and more more extreme points of view will come out. Uh, so, uh, so that to, to governments to address uh, rather than to cities to accommodate it's it's more i think and and the reason a reason for people to now speak out yeah? because something has happened it was so big that now now we could speak what we think is important yeah, yeah well, well I, I wanted to kind of say that i think that um there, there, is, there are various uh, kind of unique parts. Because first of all, uh, the entire world is experiencing the same thing, yeah. uh, and uh, the entire world has uh, had a kind of very limited series of uh, experiences. And I think that gives us uh, collectively uh, an enormous uh, space for attention. Uh, and uh, in that sense. Uh, I think uh, it's definitely no coincidence that this event in America has such a resonance uh, because we we have the attention cut right now and, and all of us are more or less questioning everything, uh, questioning our own way of life, our own uh, uh, professional uh, behavior, our own. So in that sense, I think it's a kind of amazing coincidence uh, and uh, I would you know, really hope that there is a kind of way in which we can kind of mobilize this kind of same attention uh, uh, a little, little, little bit longer. Because not only did we all experience the kind of same uh, 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 emotions, but we also saw that uh, somehow politicians were able, first of all, to uh, act with uh, a degree of coherence but also mobilize enormous, unbelievable amounts of, kind of uh, money. Um, and that uh, if you look at the, our greatest urgency, which is kind of probably uh, global warming, you know, that uh, basically the, the amount of money that they have come now mobilized is clearly enough to settle that, uh, that issue. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, what we can contribute in terms of uh, uh, claiming part of that money for for that kind of purpose, uh, and that level, I haven't seen a lot of uh, action uh, either in our profession or in the, the political uh, domain. I think it will be very uh, possible after uh, this has been uh, calmed down a little bit to to really discuss big topics. Where before you always had to kind of discuss it locally, and the, the local impact is more important than the global impact. Now we have seen that the global impact of something can be so large that it locks down everything. That we maybe now can talk about it on, the, on a bigger scale, and that's also what you see now with the racism claim. You you suddenly kind of it becomes not a localized issue or around one problem. It becomes a kind of a global issue between between many people. So I hope that that is kind of something that the effect is, and maybe that's also the effect for cities, that we can talk about the larger context of cities again, instead of the localized uh, uh, development uh, that needs to is driven by money, but that we can also think about it more holistically again, and kind of talk about problems in a holistic way, rather than a solution on a local scale. It sort of raises the question, and I mean, this is something that why there is, you know, there is this condition that I think affects us all collectively at a global scale. Uh, that, and this is something just I, I'm just curious about because it brings me back to that question of, you know, the difference of what occurred here and the movement from 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 urban to rural. And what happened in America from urban to rural and the people that uh, make that transfer. But uh, is this, you know, uh, I'm just just sort of speculating that 
would that be something that would be needed to be taken into concern is you know how do we make things or build things because you know for example in india you know buildings that are built now are basically things that are primarily exported from outside be it, you know glazing systems you know the entire construction method is a complete import and i'm not saying that as a as with any judgment of it uh, but just something that you know how does one organize then within that construct where it where while it is where the where the finances maybe are something that are tapped in at more global level uh, but you know the response is something that may be more at a local level i don't know what are your thoughts on that yeah maybe that's the case maybe kind of that there is a more global discussion that asks for particular solutions in local context but that what you see before or what what i think you saw before was that you saw localized initiatives and localized solutions and never the overarching uh, kind of idea that this was something that we had to do together or or that that we all have the same issue it was not even acknowledged that we all have the same issue we all thought there were different issues in different parts of the world uh, but now maybe that kind of perception can change that it becomes one big collective problem that needs solutions maybe on a local level but can be organized on a global scale have you ever been back bjoy to your pavilion after it's relocated yes i did go back uh, when it was relocated to the zoo yes i did and what what do you think about it in that context I thought it was very, very precise in the way that they were able to actually locate the space and the way it was organized. Uh, and it's, it's a sort of shelter for children that, you know, because the zoo has a, you know, uh, a large footfall of young children that, that come there. And so it was interesting to sort of see it located in that and being used actually by, you know, it's like a rest space for them. Yeah. Uh, and then with their families and parents, and you know, so it was quite appropriate in some ways. Yeah, our pavilion was relocated to university and kind of uh, became kind of a dialogue space for students in the public realm. Yes. And I've been back twice or so, and I just sat there in the corner and see what happened. And it's really interesting that it is kind of really heavily used, not only to eat sandwiches in 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 the break, but to also kind of really organize things. And uh, that was kind of for me interesting that it seems that these pavilions, their afterlives had become kind of really part of, of of society and part of where people meet um, and that maybe also is an interesting thought about it that it was not only kind of a moment of six months but that it is kind of maybe something that you can really make much lo last much longer yeah for me what was what was uh, interesting was that there was a very careful selection because of course one was not of course one is thinking about it's after after use but not with a specific place in mind and how each pavilion has been appropriated to a sort of quite exacting location i mean i i, I had the chance to see uh sean Gotsell's pavilion and amanda Lettitz, you know both in completely different locations and how precisely they've been sort of organized within the sort of city you know and Charles was in docklands and on a corner and they worked all of them work actually uh, really well in, in the new context. So it's it maybe a sign that the kind of things uh, are too over programmed yeah. and that the kind of luxury of pavilions is that they are not specifically programmed for anything. And that therefore uh, they, they capture a need which is uh, kind of rarely expressed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it really captured a, a possibility uh, and it, it, it delivered a possibility which kind of to me was super surprising because it was very different than you conceptualized it in the Victoria Gardens but it, mm -hmm. it is picked up in its new location completely like as if it was always there which yeah. is quite funny. Yeah.